I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly Impeachment Inquiry. Republican lawmakers officially launched their investigation of President Joe Biden. We're on Capitol Hill. Race for the White House. A recap of last night's Republican debate, including what the candidates said about abortion. Protecting the weak. The United Nations responds to the growing gang violence in Haiti and path to priesthood. The story of how 18 men from the United States dedicated their lives to God. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Wenceslaus. Our top story tonight, it is the first impeachment inquiry hearing against President Joe Biden. For nine months, House Republicans have been investigating him. They allege that he used his vice presidency office to enrich his family. Democrats claim Republicans are twisting the truth. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with the latest. Good evening. One by one, Republicans on the House Oversight Committee laid out their case of why President Joe Biden committed impeachment offenses. While one lawmaker focused on deals with China, others focused on meetings with Romanian, Ukrainian and Russian oligarchs. Chairman James Comer focused on the facts that he uncovered from the Treasury Department. As we all know, the Bidens had nothing to sell except the brand, which was Joe Biden. Hunter Biden sold the brand well, making the Biden family millions from China and elsewhere. Democrat ranking member Jamie Raskin believes the impeachment inquiry is based on a debunked theory. The majority sits completely empty handed with no evidence of any presidential wrongdoing, no smoking gun, no gun, no smoke. Law professor Jonathan Turley disagrees. I do not believe that the current evidence would support articles of impeachment. That is something that an inquiry has to establish. But I also do believe that the House has passed the threshold for an impeachment inquiry. Congressman Byron Donalds and others presented evidence of text messages, one of which was between Hunter Biden and his uncle Jim about the Biden business structure. Anyway, we can talk later, but you've been drawn into something purely for the purpose of protecting dad. And another text between Hunter and a Chinese energy agent discussing a multi-million dollar deal. Hunter says my uncle will be here with his brother in all caps, who would like to say hello to the chairman. The Bidens, coincidentally, were paid over a million dollars by CCP-affiliated Chinese company CEFC shortly after Joe Biden left office as vice president. Now we know why, because it was back pay. Before the hearing, the White House released a 15-page memo calling it a waste of taxpayer dollars. Quote, their allegations about wrongdoing by Joe Biden have been debunked and refuted by their own witnesses' testimony, the financial records they have obtained. It's clear that this investigation is all about politics and no evidence. Oversight Committee Chair Congressman James Comer says that he plans to issue subpoenas for both Hunter and James Biden's financial records. And he does plan to hold another inquiry hearing in mid-October. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Republican primary debate number two showcased seven presidential candidates all looking to unseat President Joe Biden. But they also went after each other. The three moderators often struggled to keep it orderly. All this as the front runner was nowhere near the debate in California. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. Tonight it's looking more and more like a Biden-Trump rematch is unfolding. But last night, those seven candidates tried to convince voters why they should get the job. Now, whether they were successful, of course, remains to be seen, but they could certainly be heard. I have a radical idea for the Republican Party. We need to win elections. Seven presidential candidates take the stage in the second Republican debate. A common theme ripping on the two election frontrunners. Where's Joe Biden? He's completely missing in action from leadership. And you know who else is missing in action? Donald Trump is missing in action. He should be on this stage tonight. He owes it to you to defend his record. The candidates also ripping on each other. I honestly, every time I hear you, I feel a little bit dumber for what you say. Also up for debate, hot topics like America's response to the war in Ukraine. By degrading the Russian military, we actually keep our homeland safer. We keep our troops at home. The candidates also speaking out after the debate. I think the American people are literally exhausted by American politics today, and they long for us to restore a, a threshold of civility in public life. 
There are no signs of more candidates dropping out of the race, despite low poll numbers. You want Trump Biden? Then we should all drop out now. Um, but then we see that 70 percent of the American people don't want Trump Biden. One subject that received little attention, abortion. Florida Governor DeSantis simply saying, I think we should hold the Democrats accountable for their extremism, supporting abortion all the way up until the moment of birth. Meanwhile, today, Vice President Kamala Harris continued her tour of college campuses to push what she calls reproductive rights. While President Joe Biden made a speech in Arizona claiming to defend democracy from, quote, the mega movement. And there's something dangerous happening in America now. There's an extremist movement that does not share the basic beliefs in our democracy, the MAGA movement. While former President Donald Trump, in his own speech last night in Michigan, addressing striking auto workers and others, placing the blame on President Biden. Hundreds of thousands of American jobs, your jobs, will be gone forever because crooked Joe Biden is selling out. Now, after his trip out west, which included multiple campaign fundraisers, President Biden returns here to Washington tonight. This as the clock ticks down to a possible U.S. government shutdown as soon as this weekend, a shutdown that would stop paychecks for millions of federal workers and the military. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. And we turn now to Christopher Bedford, executive editor of the Common Sense Society Network. Chris, great to be with you today. A lot to discuss. But first, let's start off with a debate. Your thoughts and who do you think came out on top last night? I think the debate struggled last night. It struggled to hit relevance. I mean, there's news already out today that Republican donors, who are basically the only members of the party who aren't backing Donald Trump right now, and looking not for anyone on that stage, but for Glenn Youngkin, the governor of Virginia, <clears throat> excuse me, as a possible alternative to Donald Trump. Last night, the things that made candidates like Vivek Ramaswamy stand out were toned down. The things that made maybe people like Chris Christie ta uh, a, a standout candidate in the past seemed weaker. His jokes fell flat. His attempts to really gain ground fell flat. After about an hour, I think uh, it just really devolved. The moderators, Univision, asked some pretty suspicious questions. They took a lot of uh, some left-wing conspiracy theories and went through them to the crowd. And I kind of found myself missing old Republican candidates like Newt Gingrich, who, when asked a bad question from a moderator, would so handily throw it back at them and get the crowd kind of in a, in a cheering sort of way against the moderator. It's something that he, he always did very well. Donald Trump did that very well. I didn't really see any candidates last night who stood out and certainly not the kind of thing that's going to make the difference in this race. Yeah, and as Owen mentioned, I mean, there were a lot of jabs exchanged between the candidates last night, including some aimed at those who weren't on stage, namely the current frontrunner, former President Donald Trump. I mean, even though he wasn't taking part in last night's debate, Chris, his presence really still loomed large. It absolutely did. And, and even very few people even wanted to talk about him. They kind of sniped at each other, and they're basically at his heels at this point as far as polling goes. Donald Trump... Uh, decided instead to go to, to to hold a rally in Detroit to talk to some of the uh, some of the, the strikers with the United Auto Workers and then to give an exclusive interview interview to the Daily Caller's Henry Rogers and he ended up coming out shining you know this is a strategy that I was surprised he took because Trump's someone who really does like a fight he doesn't like to stand aside but by pushing these guys to the side and just not even engaging with them his numbers in the polls have really only climbed I mean the only people who are really against him right now, strongly in the GOP, are the money holders. And that can be something that can play very badly for a candidate. But it played it, the same thing happened in 2016, and he got through it, and I suspect he will again. Chris, what do you think was the big takeaway from last night? That Trump's the front runner. <laughs> I mean, that was the takeaway. In the first debate, a lot of these uh, candidates hadn't really been introduced to the American people. Folks hadn't really been tuning in that much. None of them really gained ground. The second debate seemed an unlikely thing for to, for anything of the, any of that to change, and I thought they would probably be trying to catch the eyes of some of these disaffected Republican mega donors who might want to back them if they found it they were the right person, and that hasn't materialized either. So the takeaway is Trump is probably going to be the GOP candidate, barring some catastrophic event. Not a whole lot of time left, but I do want to turn to this. Uh... President Biden and the impeachment inquiry today. What stood out the most to you about these hearings, and where do you think all this is heading? I think Raskin was flailing today, the lead Democrat on this panel, who was trying to push back and say, there's no evidence, there's no evidence, there's no smoking gun, there's not even a squirt gun, he said. Well, that's not true. The evidence, the Republicans have been releasing evidence at a pretty solid clip just a few days ago, text messages back and forth between 
uh, Hunter Biden. Now, Joe Biden, right now they don't have a smoking gun that connects Joe Biden to this. They have checks going to Joe Biden's house in Hunter's name while Hunter was living in California. And now they have more text messages with Hunter Biden saying that he is doing these business deals for his father. Now, we don't have that admission from Joe Biden. It seems to be a little more careful than that. But Democrats saying that there's no evidence here, it's, that's not correct at all. And the evidence is really starting to mount. And I think Republicans have a chance of really breaking through and painting this administration, at least in time for the next election, as a corrupt one. Yeah, we're going to see what happens from here. Chris, great to be with you. Thank you so much for your insights, as always. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our California Governor Gavin Newsom has signed a measure protecting doctors who mail abortion pills to other states. A law is aimed to help those who send the pills to areas where medical abortion is banned. The California Catholic Conference is among the groups speaking out against the law. Our Governor Newsom also signed a bill to penalize schools that refuse to teach LGBTQ content. The Democrat says that he is centralizing state authority over what is taught in schools, and he will penalize schools that restrict books covering topics like gender ideology and same-sex attraction. Some school boards have removed that content over concerns that it is too sexually explicit for young children. A morning mass in Iraq honors the more than 100 victims in a deadly fire. Members from the mostly Christian community gathered to pray following that horrific fire at a Syriac Catholic wedding ceremony. A fireworks malfunction is suspected as the cause. The death toll is now over 100 and is expected to rise. Well, the head of the Chaldean Catholic Archdiocese in Iraq says the tragedy is bringing together people of all faiths. In a statement to EWTN, Archbishop Bashar Warda also said, quote, no words can adequately describe the mourning of those bringing their loved ones to their final resting places in their ancient land. I ask for your prayers for those souls who we have lost and the severely injured. I ask you to pray for the Syriac community and their families within Iraq and the diaspora. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including a united front, how the UN is tackling the growing humanitarian crisis in Haiti. And we speak with a woman who dedicates her life to helping persecuted Christians. According to the United Nations, gang violence in Haiti is escalating. The U.N. chief says over the past few months, killings, kidnappings and rapes have all increased significantly. The instability has continued in Haiti since the assassination of the country's president back in 2021. Gangs have grown more powerful since then and control 80 percent of the Port-au-Prince area. Well, for the martyrs, a preeminent voice for persecuted Christians is hosting a day of advocacy on Capitol Hill. The aim of the event is to draw attention to the persecuted Christians around the world. And in light of the recent news out of Armenia and the plight of Christians there, this year's version will take on special meaning. And joining us now to explain more is Gia Chacon, founder of For the Martyrs. Gia, great to be with you today. So tell us a little bit more about the event tomorrow taking place on Capitol Hill. And do lawmakers seem open to helping persecuted Christians around the world? Well, Tracy, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for your consistent coverage of the persecution of Christians around the world. Tomorrow for the Martyrs is excited and honored to partner with In Defense of Christians, which is another organization in the space of advocacy for the persecuted church, to host a Capitol Hill Day. And we're going to be meeting with different lawmakers. So far, we have over 20 meetings set up to talk about what's happening in Nigeria. Of course, we're gonna be talking about what's happening in Armenia. We're gonna be advocating for the plight of Christians in Iraq and Syria, um, and for Christians in Nigeria around the world. And we hope that lawmakers will turn their attention to these issues. And we're pleased today that members of Congress wrote a letter to Secretary Blinken urging him um, and the United States to take action to sanction Azerbaijan to protect Armenians. So it seems that lawmakers are paying attention to what's happening, and we hope that action is done as a result of our Hill Day and also of this letter that was uh, written today. Absolutely. We're going to continue to pray for that. You know, on the subject of Armenia, the latest we heard there, uh, there was a ceasefire with Azerbaijan. And curious, Gia, what is the latest? What do you know about that? And what is the status of the Armenian Christians in the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region? Well, Tracy, let's start with this. 
Article 2 of the Geneva Convention classifies genocide as any crime that seeks to destroy an ethnic, religious, or racial group in whole or in part uh, solely because of their identity. What's happening now in Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh is Azerbaijan destroying Armenian heritage sites that date back as far as the fourth century, destroying Armenian cemeteries, pushing out Armenians, ethnically Armenians who are Christian, who have been in this region since, again, the fourth century. Um, they are bombing them. They are beheading them on camera and sharing it on social media. This is genocide. And, you know, I have a message, and for the martyrs, we would like to know what the, Bi the Biden administration is doing, because the good thing is that in 2021, President Biden was the first president to formally recognize the Armenian genocide. But in that letter, he stated that the United States was recommitting them themselves to never allowing an atrocity like this to happen again. We would like to know, why are you allowing it to happen again in Artsakh and Nagorno-Karabakh? This is genocide in the United States, so long as it does not take action to protect Armenian Christians in the region, is complicit in another genocide. Gia, what do you think we can do? I mean, what, what can people do? We need to raise our voice, Tracy. I mean, especially as American Christians and United States citizens, we have more power than we even know to call upon our government to... Um, take action to sanction Azerbaijan to protect ethnic and Christian Armenians in this region. And that's why it's so important that we are doing our Hill Day tomorrow to call on the United States to take action. But also, Tracy, we can't forget to pray. I know a lot of times as Christians, we throw up our hands when the situation seems impossible and we say, well, there's nothing left to do but pray. But really, we know that prayer should be our first response. So we can call on the United States to take action, and we must pray for our brothers and sisters in this region. Absolutely. And I have to ask you this, G. I mean, we know, we know that Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the world. But why do you think more people don't know about this? And why do you think they don't take steps, you know, and put them into action to help out? Yes, you hit it right on the nose. Christians are the most persecuted religious group. And we believe at For the Martyrs that the reason that this doesn't receive the media attention that it deserves is, frankly, because it's politically incorrect to talk about Christian suffering. When we say that Christians are the most persecuted religious group and that Christian persecution is increasing every single year as a fact, we are then forced to answer the question, who is persecuting Christians? And frankly, it's politically incorrect to call out the top two persecutors of Christians, which is uh, radical Islam and communist governments such as China. And we're going to leave it right there, Gia. Great to be with you. Thank you for all that you're doing. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for having me. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, the journey to priesthood. 18 men take an important step in St. Peter's Basilica. Plus, the owner of an NFL team honors his cousin with an act of charity. The longtime head of the Diocese of Steubenville, Ohio, is headed to Detroit. Bishop Jeffrey Monforton has been named as the new auxiliary bishop in the Archdiocese of Detroit. The 60-year-old is headed back to his hometown. Archbishop Alan Vigneron gave a heartfelt welcome home to Bishop Jeffrey earlier today. Bishop Jeffrey served the Diocese of Steubenville for 11 years. Well, 18 men from the Pontifical North American College in Rome were ordained to the diaconate this morning. During the celebration inside St. Peter's Basilica, they prostrated themselves in front of the altar and dedicated their lives in service to God's church and his people. Ordination to the diaconate marks the last stage in seminary formation before the ordination to the priesthood. We go now to Deacon David Thomas Lee from the Diocese of Nashville, Tennessee. He is one of the 18 who took part in the ceremony today. Deacon David, welcome. Thank you so much and congratulations. Um, first off, tell us more about the ordination. What was it like for you, especially being in St. Peter's Basilica? It was such an incredible blessing uh, to be able to be ordained. On top of the bones of St. Peter, where a lot of our men, we came in the middle of the, the 2020 COVID lockdown, um, it's a lot of uncertainty, and I've journeyed here in Rome the past three years being formed by this amazing city, by this amazing seminary that we have for all of our American seminarians here in Rome. So to be able to finally reach that point where we lay down our life for the Lord, 
uh, was incredibly moving and uh, such a great gift to be able to, to be there with those men. Absolutely. And also, if you don't mind, can you tell us a little bit more about the diaconate and where it fits in the path to the priesthood for those who may aren't, maybe aren't familiar? Exactly. So the, uh, the step we took today was an ordination to the transitional diaconate. So most of the men who are ordained today within the next six to seven months will be ordained priests back in their home diocese. So this is basically the first step in the sacrament of holy orders that will be continued uh, shortly with an ordination to the priesthood uh, this spring. Yeah. And I'm curious, what's it like being at the North American College? I mean, can you tell us a little bit about your own faith journey going from Tennessee to Rome? Right. So I, I began seminary back in 2018, studied in New Orleans, Louisiana for a couple of years doing my philosophy studies and then came to Rome, like I said, in 2020 to begin studies uh, at the North American College. So I joined men from all across the country. So most seminaries back in the States are a little more regional, but here in Rome, we have people from Washington State all the way over to New York. Uh, so to be able to, to be surrounded by so many men from different dioceses uh, and to be here at the North American College has been a great experience of uh, the universal church within, within our own country. Uh, so we each study at various universities while sharing a common life of prayer and formation as we get ready to be priests back in the United States. Well, Deacon David, thank you for sharing your time with us today. We appreciate it, and congratulations again. God bless. Well, finally tonight, the owner of the Indianapolis Colts announcing a donation, a significant one at that, to the Catholic Charities. Jim Ursi said that he will donate $5 million to Catholic Charities of Chicago. It is in honor of his late cousin, Sister Joyce Dura. He says Sister Joyce spent a half a century giving back to others, and he wants to follow her example with his donation. Ursay grew up Catholic in Chicago. Catholic Charities Chicago serves more than 350,000 free meals each year. Oh, hey, thank you for watching tonight. And remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.